there's a toll that it takes. But, you know, that's part of your responsibility as being a writer and just trying to use your imagination and working with the pieces that you have. And the pieces that we had were at times very uncomfortable to confront. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, we speak to a brilliant screenwriter who's kindly dug out their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. This week, we're joined by David Rabinowitz and Charlie Wachtel, writers of 2018's incredible Black Klansman. Directed by the one and only Spike Lee, the film told the true life tale of Ron Stallworth, a black police detective working in 1970s Colorado who attempted to infiltrate the white supremacist world of the KKK. This movie walked away with Best Adapted Screenplay at the 2018 Oscars, and for good reason. Black Klansman was tense, darkly comic, and disturbingly relevant. Famously, the film ends with real-life footage of recent racist rallies in America, drawing a line between the events on screen and the times we're living in today. Co-written by Spike Lee and frequent collaborator Kevin Wilmot, the film's a stylish, powerful thriller that speaks to the violence and division of both Trump's America and America's past. Here's what Charlie and David had to say about the racial fault lines they wanted the film to expose, the tricky task of laughing at bigots on screen without minimising their monstrousness, and the compelling character within the movie that Get Out's Jordan Peele secretly helped shape. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Charlie, David, welcome to Script Apart. How are you? Doing fine. Doing well. Thanks for having us. So we're a couple of years out now from Black Klansman. Um, so it's, it's been about five years, I think, since you wrote that draft that we're going to touch on today. The film went from this idea for a movie shared by two guys who had known each other since high school to winning at the Oscars, winning at the BAFTAs. And it also found itself at the center of America's reaction to the Charlottesville rallies in 2017. How do you begin to reflect now on the whirlwind of making this movie? It's very hard to process. I don't know. It's like, it's one of those things where you know that it happened, right? (laughs) You know that you experienced it. I rewatched the the Oscar ceremony video when our name was called. Uh, I rewatched it like three weeks ago because it's on YouTube and you can just watch it whenever you want. And I, I was reliving the experience all over again um, because I, I don't know if I had forgotten about it or tried to block it out of my mind that it wasn't real or whatever. But yeah, I, I had the opportunity to relive it again and it was really, really great. Every step of like the way of like it, bec- it you know, us with the script and then it becoming a movie and then it going through the awards process. Like if you break it down into individual steps, like they all make sense on some level, like logically. But then when you look at it, like all together, it makes no sense. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it did happen. And we are here to discuss it today. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I mean, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so obviously this is a true story. Um, you came across Ron's memoir and you felt really passionately that this is a story that hasn't gone told and you wanted to, to bring it to life and bring it to the screen. Was there anything beyond a recognition of, wow, this guy's story is incredible and perhaps has a contemporary urgency that made you want to tell it? Like, what, what was it about Ron's story that spoke to you guys and your backgrounds as people, not just as screenwriters? Well, I think we were, we were first and foremost, just as writers looking to establish ourselves as thriller writers. And uh, the story had a lot of the ingredients uh, for telling a thriller story. Um, But it also had, you know, the fact that it's, you know, there are comedic elements and the African-American film goers market is just very underserved. And it, it had all those things going for it. And when you, when you're a writer and you find a piece of material, a piece of IP, um, and it's a story that you really don't want to let go, you, you really have to just, you know, grab it by the horns and, and forge ahead. Um, and, and in our case, we were lucky enough that nobody had the rights to the story. Hollywood's like obsessed with like true stories. Right. And then they're also obsessed with like high concepts. And so this was both, 
you know, it's technically a, a high concept. That's also a true story. And um, also like, you know, we, as I'm sure we'll talk about, we got to know Ron yeah. and we knew from the book that Ron was an, uh, an interesting, compelling character that w- was capable of supporting a film, being the protagonist of a two hour film. Cause not every true life character uh, is that is compelling enough to, to kind of anchor a film. Yeah, I'm interested about like some of the conversations that you guys must have had after you discovered Ron's book together and realized that it was kind of amazing that it hadn't yet been turned into a film because there's so much to mine there. Um, but yeah, I'd be really interested to hear about some of the conversations you guys had about the sensitivity needed regarding telling the story, the, the responsibility you had towards Ron and the work, the groundwork that would be needed to tell the story with the right kind of specificity. Going into this story, the the elephant in the room is we're, we're two white guys writing this story uh, about an African-American. And uh, there is a lot of sensitivity that comes with that. And from the very beginning, we knew that in order to tell the story responsibly, we would have to involve Ron as much as possible in the process, which he was happy to be involved in as much as possible. Um, and he, you know, he would scour all of our drafts and, and give us page by page line item notes um, as often as he could. We would have like hours long conference calls with Ron. Um, even one time at a bachelor party, we had to sk- escape away into a hotel room because Ron had called. So we had to just kind of drop everything. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's great that uh, Ron was just so generous with his time and uh we, we felt that that sort of took away the uh, the burden that we were carrying. And from what I understand of his memoir, I mean, Ron was a policeman, so he wrote it in a quite a police report-like way in terms of the prose. What was the process for you guys like of finding a cinematic way of translating his story? It was almost like, um, it, it, it was almost beneficial, the, the fact that he wrote it like that, because it's yeah. like... Uh, it's just very kind of to the point, very clear. There's nothing really flowery about it. He just sort of tells you what you need to know. Uh, it lends itself to, 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 to having us come in and, and use our imaginations and, and really flesh it out the way that we wanted to do um, and, and ha- have the creative liberty to do what we wanted to do with it. And imagine a world. If you read, if you read that, memoir you see that there's certain like you can call them tent poles like tent pole events in the true story uh ron calling the clan for the first time you know that we we put that in the script not too far from the way it was on the memoir uh white spike did you know did with it you know of course you can see on screen and when we were writing it originally we're like well if this becomes a movie like this is definitely in the trailer this scene because this it's a great scene, but it also establishes the the concept, you know, and the, and the premise of it. Um, and then, you know, the idea of him developing the relationship with David Duke that was in the true story. And then the whole thing of David Duke coming to Colorado Springs and Ron asked, you know, being asked to be his bodyguard. That was all, that was all real. And it's like, okay, that's going to kind of give us our third act. We have kind of this, a couple of events in the first act. We have this general framework for a third act. And then it's up to us to kind of fin- fill in the, the rest of it. And in terms of the chronology, guys, this was 2015, which is when like the Ferguson riots were happening, or Ferguson protests, I should say, rather. I mentioned at the beginning, I kind of presumed that you guys recognized a contemporary urgency. Obviously, in the finished film, Spike put that amazing, really powerful footage from Charlottesville at the end and sort of hammered home the contemporary relevance of it. When you were writing it, were you aware that this was not a period piece? It was a it was a story relevant to now, and that yeah, I'm wondering sort of like when you were writing it, how your writing coincided with Ferguson and the climate in America at the time. Yeah, I think at the time we were writing it, we it was always just this is an American story, and you know this is a story that can be told you know ten years ago or or today. It didn't matter. Um, but as the as the the presidential election campaign was progressing, uh, we kind of realized that this was a little bit 
we have to capture a changing America, a changing landscape. And, uh, you know, we did find ways to try to make the story more contemporary as much as possible moving into 2016. Um, but of course, I think the last time we were able to even rewrite it, uh, the story was before Trump was even brought into power. Uh, so it was, you know, more incumbent upon Spike and Kevin to take it more in that direction and, and, and really make sure that it connects with what was going on uh, at the time in our country. That's interesting. Did the film always have that title? Because I know that when Spike came on, he turned it into one word with three Ks, very purposefully joining the two words together. Um, but yeah, like this, this draft doesn't have a title on. Was, was Black Klansman the title from the beginning? It, it, was, it was that, but uh, ours was two words and it was the same exact uh, title of Ron's memoir. And uh, we always thought it was a great title because it's like, that's, that's, what it, it, that's the high concept. That's the premise. That's the main yeah. character. Uh, that's the tagline. And then, yeah, I, I think at one point we read Kevin and Spike's uh, draft, like the shooting draft or close to the shooting draft. And we saw that the, that had been put, put together and, and the extra K put in there. And we're like, wow, well, that's, that's an attention grabber. Nice yeah. touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it is interesting, speaking of Spike, like this first draft is a really great insight into kind of what the collaboration process might have been and what it must have been like with Spike taking this baby of yours and adding his own kind of parental touches to it because the meat and bones of the story is there and the structure is very much intact. But there are places where Spike has found room within the dialogue and within scenes to kind of add his own flourishes. I mean, let's just ask the obvious question of how wild was it, the experience of working with him? Had, had you dared to dream at all that your script could end up in the hands of someone like him? It, when we were working on it, it was a, it was a joke between us <laughs> that, oh yeah, Spike Lee's going to direct it. It was like literally something that we joked about in the wow. early stages. Um, yeah, and we've always been huge fans. Like I remember kind of, I, I think every film fan like sort of comes of age at a certain point maybe around like high school or college. And I remember seeing do the right thing for the first time and just immediately it's one of my favorite movies, you know? Um, so, I mean, it, there was never like, there was never any expectation that, like, that we'd ever be able to work with somebody like Spike, but in, in terms of like actually working with him, we didn't, we didn't really work with him. We just sort of handed the script off. And what it was, was, us coming into the offices of the producers after Spike and Kevin had been, done their draft and reading the shooting script. And so the last we, last we knew, we handed off our script to, to Spike. And then next thing we know, we're, we're sitting there and reading uh, something that is simultaneously our script and, si and not our script at all. In what ways is it not your script, would you say? As you say, there's, like, there's a lot of flourishes that Spike puts in and a lot of, I mean, first of all, right off the bat, uh, to give a very specific example, the, um, the scene where Ron goes undercover at the uh, Kwame Ture rally. In, in our version, that, that speech is cut very short. Like, I yeah. think you, see, you like, see the beginning and then you see the end and then it's about Ron, you know, going up to him. And then in Spike's case, he's like, well, I, Spike loves speeches. And he saw it as an opportunity to do a speech in, a, in an incredibly cinematic way. He really, and, he really turned that scene uh, from just a scene into more of what felt like a rally inside the movie theater, which was yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Corey and then, Hawkins was so great that he just oh, yeah. completely anchored that whole thing. Right. Cause it could, that could easily, you know, it could easily not work if you don't have an actor who's, who's charismatic enough to carry it. He does. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in this, in that same way, the scene that ended up being Harry Belafonte, you know, telling the story of of the lynching in, in Waco, wasn't in our draft at all. In our draft, it was just the uh, clan initiation followed by them watching Birth of a Nation. And in Spike and Kevin's version, he's intercutting that with this story. And then further, in our draft, they watch Birth of a Nation, but it's not. It's kind of a matter of fact thing. It's not a, a major deal. And what Spike does what Spike and Kevin do 
is they make it into a whole commentary on that film. Also connected to the fact that they add the Gone with the Wind footage in the beginning, which was not in our original. Our original starts with the, the interview of, uh, uh, of Ron. The entire Alec Baldwin sequence in the, in the very beginning was uh, Spike and Kevin's that too. edition. There is a little bit of that, though. There is, um, so I believe your first draft starts with, um, it starts with this pre-recorded message, this like propaganda message from the KKK. And I mean, obviously, the finished film does begin in a different way. There's that whole Gone with the Wind thing. It's heroic music. We zoom out onto a Confederate flag. But there's still that sort of idea of starting on an, a bit of exposition, a bit of a glimpse into what the KKK are and what their ideology is and how their propaganda machine works. Why, why was it important to you guys in that first draft even to sort of like have that little kind of glimpse into what this horrible, monstrous machine is? That's a great question. I think it's a few things. I think maybe stylistically, we're kind of fans of like that start, that kind of dramatic start on black where you just hear something. And yeah, yeah I, I think maybe it was, it was sort of just setting the mood ominous because we're, you know, we're meeting Ron and we're, you know, getting into his life in that first scene, but we're not, it takes a little bit of time to get into the whole KKK aspect. So we Most of the first that. act is not the KKK. So we, we, we yeah. wanted, yeah, we wanted to kind of introduce that element. And then a fun fact, I think, and I've seen the film enough times that I should know this, but I think that that thing that we included in the beginning, you actually hear a bit of it when, right before David Duke in the movie um, picks up for the first time. It's like the hold, the, 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 the hold uh, uh, message. Yeah. When you try to call the KKK, right? Is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was funny that they ended up using that is, is elsewhere. And Charlie, you say that, uh, you know, the first act isn't the KKK, but that's not to say that Ron isn't during this entire first act encountering racism. So we meet him, he's interviewing for this position as a cop. His superior asks him what he's going to do when, not if a colleague calls him the N-word. There's then a scene in your draft where another officer measures his head for his police hat, at an act that already has kind of a, ra- a racial dimension in itself but it doesn't account for his hair. So he's walking around in this kind of misfitting hat. Seems to kind of be a metaphor for how he is going to struggle to fit in here in this predominantly white institution. It all speaks to this idea that he's not quite at home. There's this sense sense that like Ron has joined, if not a racist institution, then at the very least an institution that allows racial bias to go unchallenged and unchecked. So yeah, can you tell me a little bit about sort of like why it was that you, it was important to you to make this not a story about hero cops saving the day, but about a black man navigating a racist system to do good cop work. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of the great ironies of the story is is that he's you have Ron going up against this terrorist organization that's filled with hatred, um, and in doing so, he himself finds himself part of this hate filled institution. The police are just as racist as the Ku Klux Klan. There's so much irony to ring out there that was so rich for us to explore. Um, and it, it, it certainly says a lot about where we are and, and where we come from and our institutions and how much work we have to do um, across the board, not only in just targeting the worst of the bad people, but even calling out the, the ones that have infested our, you know, institutional structures uh, that have been in place for all these years. There's that incredibly tense, straight off the bat, like only a few minutes into that film, one of Ron's colleagues says, I need another file on a toad. And Ron replies, I don't have any toads. I have files on human beings. And there's this kind of standoff. When you were writing that, was this all based in Ron's experiences? Did a lot of these kind of details come out of your conversations with Ron as well as the memoir? Definitely. Yeah. The, um, the scene where, he, where you mentioned uh, where he's getting his hat and it's, it's the wrong size for him, that was straight from the memoir and from Ron's experience. Uh, and yeah, the, the whole thing with him being in the records room and having officers ask for a file on, on a toad uh, was straight from his experiences. And um, I thought something interesting that Kevin and Spike did with that was in our draft, that standoff that he has is just sort of with a, a random 
like cop uh, who we never see again. Mm. And what they did is they made, they kind of created this um, other character. What's his name? Like Weller is the character's name. He's like the really bad cop. And they, they kind of made that. It was like the same scene, but they made it that guy, Uh, which made sense for storytelling efficiency because it's like, okay, this guy's going to come up later. And he does (laughs) multiple times. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And uh, I mean, that interaction as well as working big picture sense of themes you wanted to explore and the sort of duality of, well, there are bad cops as well. It also works from a story perspective because that interaction gives Ron motivation to get out of the records room and start demanding some proper police work. So, you know, he eventually, uh, Lieutenant Arthur, as he's known here, is reluctant at first, but eventually says, I've got a job for you. It's undercover. He tells him to wear street clothes. Ron is tasked to go to this rally. So he heads down there and it's here he meets Angie. I think she's called Patrice in the final film, but she's called Angie here. So this character didn't exist in real life from what I've read. Why place her into the story? What does she represent to you guys? Originally, so Ron had a, uh, at the time in real life, he had a girlfriend who would become his wife. And in our, I think there was a point where we had her as a character. And then, you know, Ron asked us to not do that. And then we fictionalized it. We fictionalized it. Yeah. Originally, we had uh, the character of Angie, who is Angie, who is now uh, Patrice, as someone who was attending uh, the uh, Kwame Ture rally. Uh, but in Spike and Kevin's draft, she not only was attending the rally, but she was the president of the Black Student Union. Yeah. And then so I, I think it might have been uh, in conversations with Jordan Peele about, it, you know, who came on as a producer uh, well before Spike was involved, where he was looking at this character and saying, well, it could be interesting if she's ideologically opposed to uh to the cops and so what that gives you is that interesting thing where it's where this ron is basically he's undercover you know going you know when he's infiltrating the clan but he's also kind of undercover when he's dealing with her and it's kind of like it's adding to that thematic element of being undercover and it also it kind of adds a layer of like tension to their relationship um and that just it, that was that was one of uh, Jordan's like uh, creative contributions to the to, to the finished thing. You know, he for some reason he he doesn't like to take credit for it. But first of all, it wouldn't have happened without him because he he's the one who connected the script to uh, gave the script to Spike. But then also he he gave like legitimate creative contributions like that. Yeah, that's so interesting because there's a whole other element to the film, but. There is also a part of this movie that is an undercover cop movie that hits a lot of the same beats that classic undercover cop stories tell. So yeah. you've got this guy who goes undercover and spiritually gets lost in the weeds and his allegiances get tested and he ends up towards a third act not knowing which side his allegiances are blurred. So that's like a fun film trope that's present in everything The Departed to even like James Cameron's Avatar. Were there touchstones in terms of like other stories and other scripts? I think a film we, we kind of just go back to structurally is, is Beverly Hills Cop, uh, you know, <laughs> just in terms of the fact that it is a police story uh, set at a police station, a lot of the a lot of the plot and uh, it's a, it's a fish out of water situation. It's, it's a, it's a cultural clash of, of one character who does things his own way and uh, a longstanding police department that has its traditions and, and doesn't want anyone to sort of interfere with the way they do things. Um, so that was, that was a big one for us to keep coming back to. You mentioned The Departed. We definitely talked about that. Uh, Donnie Brasco. Yeah, that's, of course. What, that's one of the touchstones. The idea of like when you're doing undercover, you get some stuff for free, which is when the, when the character who's going undercover is undercover, like you have that element of tension in, in those scenes. Um, it's funny you mentioned Avatar because I think in like, I was just going back through like our initial notes and I wrote a note about like Avatar and Dances with Wolves. of Like <laughs> yeah. the idea of like, when someone is going kind of undercover as, you know, his partner does eventually, like there should be a warming up period. That person shouldn't immediately be accepted 
into the group. Like it should take time. There should be an obstacles of uh, before they're you know completely accepted as one of one of the group. That's interesting. So yeah, we uh, before we move on to the next scene, there's this great interaction where. Ron gets to meet Stokely Carmichael, as it is in the first script, and asks him, Mr. Carmichael, do you, do you really think a war between the black and white race is inevitable? And Stokely pulls him close, too close. Ron stands mid-grip with him, nerves pinballing. Stokely lowers his voice, looking around conspiratorially. Brother, arm yourself. Get ready. The revolution is coming. We're going to have to kill Whitey. So <laughs> that, that scene, steeping Ron in Angie's world, what were you trying to bring out in the character and what were you, what pins were you trying to set up in terms of his allegiances and uh, the, the sort of way that things would kind of pan out in terms of the plot later on towards the third act? First of all, uh, that moment is straight from the memoir. So we can't even take credit for that line there because it's like, that's exactly as Ron recounted it. Uh, Ron, Ron even, Ron even uh, demonstrated that entire situation for us when we drove down to visit him uh, at, when he was in Newport Beach. He grabbed my hand, he pulled me in real close and he's like, this is how close I actually was to Stokely Carmichael. And it was intense and scary. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but it, more than that, it was like, yeah, it was setting up this, this double life for, for Ron. He's kind of caught in the middle. He talks about it in the book. Like he's caught in between these two worlds of, you know, you know, being a police officer and then those who are ideologically opposed to the police. And he, a group, he's sitting in that rally and you see it in the film. It's on our script and it's also in the film. He's sitting in that rally and he's listening to what this guy is saying. And he's like, this makes a lot of sense to me, you know? Uh, so part of it psychologically is like, how does Ron square those two contradictory things at the same time? He's mm -hmm. undercover, supposed to be infiltrating this group. And yet he agrees with a lot of what this group is saying. Uh, you know, maybe he's just, he just takes issue with that last part, you know? of uh, the advocation of, of, uh, of violence. Uh, and then also like the idea of him, of, uh, you know, Stokely or, or Kwame Ture advocating, you know, saying that base, essentially like there's going to be a race war that is then mirrored later with the uh, character of uh, Butch. Yeah. From the KKK, who is basically saying the exact same thing, just from the other side. We then get back to the police, pre uh, police precinct where we meet the man who's going to be Ron's partner as the film moves forward. So in the finished film, he's played by Adam Driver and his name is Flip. Here, his name is Chuck. So this guy was Ron's real life partner. He was codenamed, he did exist. He was codenamed Chuck in Ron's memoir, but that's not obviously his real name. Can you tell me a bit about sort of, yeah, the development of this character and why it was, I mean, you took a little bit of cre creative license with this character, um, and one of the main differences um, between real life and your script is is that character wasn't Jewish in real life, but you made the decision to make him Jewish in the film. Why was that? Right. One of, one of the inherent uh, challenges that this story presented was the fact that, okay, if Ron is going to get someone else to go and be undercover for himself, then we're going to have to be with that person in these really tense situations and we're going to have to make those moments count as much as possible. Ron, uh, is, is still the main character, but when we see him, it's going to be, it's going to be over the phone. It's going to be when he's outside surveilling his partner, uh, who's in these situations. And so we really wanted to make the audience as invested as possible in the Chuck or flip character. And the best way to do that was, giving him uh, this identity that uh, didn't uh, gel well with the situations that he was finding himself in. Um, yeah. And then also like, that was like the initial thing. Cause it's like, it's a very pragmatic thing. Like he's a cop. Yeah, that's fine. But if they found out, I don't know, uh, they probably wouldn't get, I mean, they'd get, they'd be mad, but they probably wouldn't want to kill the guy. But if he's Jewish, then all of a sudden that adds an, another layer of tension. Uh, and then once we made that decision, it was like, okay, but thematically it, it fits because now like while Ron is sort of, you know, split along 
split in two worlds. Now, suddenly, Chuck is dealing with the same thing. They're mirrors of each other. Uh, the fact that David Duke becomes a major character, it's, it, it fits with this because David Duke hates Jews so much. Uh, and then also, like, we're both Jewish. And so that was kind of uh, our way in. Uh, and it, you know, event, when you take a step back, it's like, it kind of sounds like a, a joke, a bad joke, like a black <laughs> guy and a Jewish guy infiltrate the KKK. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad actually you bring up jokes because there is actually a lot of humor in this film, unexpectedly given the subject matter. Uh, it comes out, especially in the dealings with David Duke later in the film, which we'll get to. But I'd love to know about, yeah, sort of like how you guys approached the film tonally because it's so interesting there. There are moments where you lean into the absurdity of racism and the ridiculousness of how vile these characters are that, that we're about to meet. And, and humor almost acts as this release valve in the film because there are moments where you would want to, if you weren't laughing, you'd want to scream in outrage and fury at the beliefs of some of these guys. So yeah, could you tell me about sort of like how you went about constructing the tonal balance? Yeah, I think it was just uh, in an early conversation that we had with Ron. Um, it was very important for Ron that this would be a story that could be taken seriously. Um, and to that end, we focused on the genre of thriller. We want to make this thrilling, compelling, a little bit scary, intense. Um, but there's also this humor element that you just can't ignore. Uh, and it, it does serve as a release valve for us. And to Ron, it was very important, um, especially because this was one of his you know, greatest memories of the entire uh, uh, investigation was the humor that would come out of, you know, listening to these conversations and, and laughing with a lieutenant who's red in the face um, and, and kind of has to walk out of and stumble out of the door so that he doesn't, you know, the guy on the phone doesn't hear him laughing. Uh, that was a real element of this. So from the get go, it was like, okay, we want to do about 70% uh, thriller drama, 30% comedy or so. And it was important to preserve that element. The situation itself is pretty absurd. So it's like, we didn't have to like push. We didn't have to like manufacture laughs. No. Exactly. Exactly. So we just sort of, yeah, like you said, leaned into the absurdity of the situation, kind of let the situation play out uh, organically. And the next scene is where the plot really kicks in. So Ron's at his desk, cup of tea in the paper in front of him. He uh, spots a number in the classifieds for the KKK. And he gives them a call. He reaches this pre-recorded message, leaves a number, and then gets this message back. It says in the script, ring, ring. Ron finally answers. This is Ron, and through the receiver, a gravelly, secretive voice. This is Ken. I'm calling back from the organization. Um, we then have this, like, I mean, what's become to be, what, what's gone on to be, an almost like borderline iconic scene from the film, where he, in the middle of in the middle of the precinct, Ron is just barking all this like exaggerated hate speech back that the, the KKK want to hear down the line. No one else knows what's going on and all his like colleagues are looking at him in absolute astonishment. You you already touched on this on this scene. You obviously knew early on that this was going to be sort of one of the most kind of jaw-dropping sequences in the film and it was going to be as you said the the scene that would go in the trailer. Can you tell me about the process of writing it? How much um, how much of that interaction was lifted straight from Ron's experience and what it was like putting it together? In real life, it was a little a little less cinematic. Like he, I think he filled out like a, something in the mail, and then you know, then he, he got a call like a, a week later or, or or something. So all we wanted to do was just get rid of that, just make it something that he would immediately call. But like what he says is pretty much lifted verbatim from the memoir. I think the element that we just juiced up was the fact that, you know, having his colleagues listen to him and react. And then what Spike and Adam Driver ended up doing was adding that really great like chair turn that he does in the in the movie. <laughs> yeah. So that's it's it's that scene is a prime example of like the collaboration process really working. It's like the the the, the meat was there from the the source from the memoir. We built upon it and then, you know, Spike and, and, and Kevin and his actors like really um, 
just made it work. And there's then this plan that's hatched and as well as being an undercut movie, it's almost like a heist movie, the, the plan coming together to infiltrate this chapter of the KKK. Um, so we have uh, Ron grilling Chuck on his routine as like the, the fictional white supremacist version of Ron Stallworth. Um, was again, all that stuff, that, that kind of preparation-y stuff, that then becomes like the bulk of, you know, sort of act one as we verge into act two. Um, was all that, that stuff must have been quite fun. The actual kind of like, technicality of how Ron executed this plan. That must have been a lot of fun to kind of write and bring to the screen. For sure. I, and Ron was super, when we were talking to him, he was, he was super uh, insistent on the fact that when you're doing an operation like this, everything has to be consistent. That's the most important thing. So the information anytime, you know, when Ron would talk to them on the phone and then, you know, Chuck would go in person, they'd have to have basically these recap conversations where they went over every single thing that was said so that they wouldn't contradict themselves at, at, a, at, a, at a later point. And so we knew that that was a, something that we had to get in there because it's just, it, it, like you said, it's a fun, it's a fun thing uh, that they would have to be dealing with constantly as part of this undercover operation. There's then that scene where Chuck makes contact. He, um, so Chuck is being sort of like prepped as the white version of Ron. Ron is given his... He's given his real name by accident. Um, so Chuck has to go in and sort of be his like uh, his his avatar almost. Just go back to the uh, the James Cameron film. Um, so he, Chuck hops in the car with this Nazi guy named Butch and Ron follows them. But he's spotted. There's that moment of tension where Ron almost gets shot kind of driving behind them. Chuck eventually meets them in this dive bar, just like in the movie. And it's here that you kind of begin to really dig into like, to the farcical nature of these characters and their ideo ideology. Like we meet one of them, Dwayne, who's like drunkenly spouting plans about fireworks. And Chuck's kind of like throwing in these facts as if to impress them, but Dwayne doesn't know any of these facts. And he's like, wow, we've got to get you in. I didn't know any of this stuff. So he doesn't even know about, the, <laughs> he doesn't know much about the ideology of the uh, institution that he begin belongs to. Um, it's uncomfortable to watch and it's uncomfortable to read here in the first draft. How uncomfortable was it to write? Does it, does it take much of a human toll on you being kind of steeped in the, the world and the language of these bigots? Sure. There, there's a, there's a toll that it takes, but you know, that's part of your responsibility as, as being a writer, just trying to use your imagination and working with the pieces that you have and the pieces that we had were at times very uncomfortable to confront and uh, to work with. So yeah, it's it's unusual going into a process knowing, okay, I have to, I got to write this scene. Three of the four characters in the scene are racist. This is their attitude. This is their ideology. And I'm just going to, I'm going to run with it uh, and see where it takes me. And that's where the book was, was very helpful for us, but it was also helpful to do some, outside research and, and, and look up and, and see what people who are like them really, really, truly believe. And what, what did some of that research look like? Uh, it can be anything from uh, books, uh, anything that has to do with the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan uh, Definitely spend a lot of time on, well, not a lot of time, but some time on David Duke's website. <laughs> see what that guy's up to. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very clips on YouTube. Yeah. 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 Went back, you know, in the seventies, you know, when he was kind of presenting this clean cut version of, uh, uh, of the clan, uh, you know, not, not your father's, uh, KKK, you know, um, it wasn't as bad for like, we're, we're very sympathetic to like Topher Grace who apparently <laughs> like really had to steep himself in the character, but like, yeah, we needed to, we needed to know, uh, what, someone like that was thinking and then like there's some like uh some of those like neo-nazi sites i remember glancing at a bit it's not fun <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to I see mean, what the, those folks are saying so these guys they aren't fringe loners i always suspected that there's a reason why it may well have happened that ron was taken to butch's very nice suburban home but it seems quite purposeful that we visit Butch and this bunch of Nazis at his very nice home with his darling wife to kind of like present the fact that these aren't 
weirdos living in like trailer parks. These are like members of society that are considered upstanding. Like, yeah, I mean, you, if if you're going to join the clan, you you have to start somewhere, and they all don't come from you know the trailer park community where you would hope to think that they they might come from. Uh, they're they're people that live right across the street from you. They're your next door neighbors, and and that's one of the most disturbing parts of the story, but also of, you know, reality. And, and, and today is, you know, these people are all around us. Yeah. I think it, it was a conscious choice. I think for Butch in particular, because the way that we describe, you know, introduce him and as he's portrayed in the film, like he is kind of like the, the, the worst of the lot and the one you'd expect to be, you know, uh, living in a, a you know, uh, you probably may, maybe don't expect him to be in like this like nice house, and it's like have well, a nice wife who's who's serving these hors d'oeuvres, and you know this is considered like a a, a gathering of friends. It's not considered right. a clan meeting. This is just something that they do. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's just to them it's 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 normal. I think we wanted to to just uh, communicate the normalcy of that. There's then this incredibly tense scene that's among the most tense in the film or the most thrilling where um butch is suspicious of chuck he wants him to kind of like prove his like white credentials almost and he suspects him of being jewish he wants him to take a polygraph test ron's listening in and obviously knows god i've got to do something so he darts over there to the front lawn grabs a flower pot throws it through butch's window they all kind of rush out butch fires his gun at ron as he drives away um it's this kind of daring escape. And back at the precinct, there's this kind of real fun, like cop film thing where the sergeant says, lie detector, shots fired. You guys are putting me in a goddamn mess. If Taggart heard about this, was that just something you couldn't resist? I love those sort of cop stories, those cop narratives where you have like the, the you know, the, the beleaguered boss who's like, oh, the super ten- superintendent's going to be on at me about this. Was that just something you couldn't resist putting in? It's just go, going back to the tropes of, of a cop movie. And, and all of that was, you know, we felt there was a layer of authenticity with because we had Ron looking over our shoulder. I mean, Dave and I only know as much about cops from what we see in cop movies for the most part. But Ron was always there watching saying this would happen or, or this is the way it's supposed to happen. It also helped that. um, So every, just about every character in the film turns out to be sort of fictionalized, including like the partner Chuck uh, with, I think just like three exceptions, Uh, Ron, obviously David Duke, and then Ron's sergeant. Uh, who turns like in real life was kind of this like really good guy uh, who kind of looked out for Ron, you know, his immediate sergeant. And so any scene where we could kind of include him as being both, uh, you know, sort of annoyed or pissed off or just frustrated with Ron, but at the same time wanting to help him and protect him, we could, you're, we couldn't resist. (laughs) throwing stuff like that in there (laughs) and you mentioned david duke there we then start to introduce him somehow ron gets on the phone to david duke and um yeah it's a fascinating kind of like relationship that develops there um yeah can you tell me a little bit you am i right in thinking you shifted the timelines around a little bit for this there was some it, it didn't quite work out from what i've read as as linear um, in real life, there was there was a bit of moving around in terms yeah, of yeah, definitely. Timeline. Are you talking specifically in terms of like David Duke or in terms of like other stuff? From what I've read, the, the timeline in terms of the conversations with David Duke and then him coming to Colorado. The film's all set, I think, in seventy two. Is that correct? But maybe he didn't come to Colorado till seventy nine. Oh right, right. Seventy eight, I think it was. Oh wow. Um, yeah. So yeah, the 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 film. The way we had structured structured the plot sort of condensed events from, I believe it was from like 1972 to 1979. Um, and, and we sort of just, yeah, condensed timeline made it a lot easier for us to jam all of this information into a screenplay. Right. Because I, I think Ron, I think, maybe entered the police department in 72, but then the events of the investigation didn't happen until later, like seven, like you said, 78. Um, 
So then we kind of, yes, pushed it all together. But then Spike and Kevin, what they did uh, for various reasons was just shift the whole thing earlier in the 70s. The David Duke that we meet, probably very true to the David Duke in real life, is this farcical moron who you have a lot of fun at his expense. But there's, there's this discourse at the moment around like the danger of laughing at racists and the, the, the potential of that humanizing them in some way. And um, it, it seems a tricky balance to get right because showing the absurdity of people with dangerous, deranged views, it can sometimes minimize their monstrousness. I mean, people were so divided, for example, over Jojo Rabbit. So did you, kind of, did you guys kind of have an awareness of like the need to tread carefully? How did you go about getting that right? It was tricky. Um, because it, it, it's, you don't want to like downplay them. Uh, also, it could hurt the stakes too. You know, you go too far into making them cartoony, then you're not uh, afraid of them and you should be. Um, I I guess it was probably two things. First, it was as long as like we approached it from a grounded place, like those place, those points where, you know, Ron, the the scene where he's talking with David Duke and he's being an idiot and his sergeant is listening and and can't even help himself. Like that feels like it's real. And and it it was real because that's like, that's something that actually happened to Ron. Um, The idea that, we're kind of laughing at these people, but then eventually by the end of the story, they pull off or try to pull off a bombing. Uh, we felt that maybe that would carry it. It's like, yeah, these people are ridiculous until they're not when they're actually doing something that uh, has real consequences. And, mm-hmm. and these things, it's not just idle talk. It's actually action with some of these people. Which chimes with something that we were seeing in politics at the time and that we're Continuing to see now, so Donald Trump very much ran on this like kind of clowny, kind of oddball platform where he was going on like a, you know uh, he was going on like t- late night TV shows and having his hair ruffled, and it was very it was all very kind of like buffoonish and playful, but of course like it all masks a dark side, and uh, yeah, we we've seen that in full force over the last four years. Um, it seems like, I mean, was there something you were trying to articulate there or was something you were playing with? This idea of like David Duke, this monster having this kind of buffoonish exterior. That's a good point. Yeah. Everybody was, it was Jimmy Fallon, right? Yeah. Uh, people were upset about that. And a lot of people, uh, I think myself included, were just like, uh, didn't take Trump seriously. Like, oh, he's a clown. There's no way he's going to win. And then he won. I think that was always just a, uh, something that we had in the back of our minds of we have to get the balance right of simultaneously laughing at these people and then also perceiving them as uh, this is a genuine problem Mm -hmm. um and that's honestly and that you know I, i don't know how well we got the balance right but it's like in the final film spike kind of underlines it when he includes the charlottesville footage at the end almost like oh we you know we've had our fun today but then you know I'm going to leave, I'm going to have, I'm going to leave you with this yeah. and no one's going to be laughing by the end of this thing. There is this moment a little bit later on as uh, their relationship continues to blossom and Ron continues to somehow string Duke along. Ron at one point says he can't resist and he says, say, Mr. Duke, I have to ask, aren't you ever concerned that smart Alec N-word might be calling you pretending to be white? And Duke replies, I can always tell when I'm talking to an N-word. At around this same part in the script, there's also a beat a few minutes later where um, Ron accuses Chuck of fitting in with them just fine. Playing the part is one thing, but it sounded like on some level you meant every word. What did you want to show happening to Ron's psyche at this point? It seems like things are fraying and uh, yeah, kind of get he's losing himself a little bit as we ramp towards that final act. Part of it was just kind of like the, the typical thing of wanting to push your characters as far as possible. This was also kind of the end of act two where we following a, you know, a a fairly typical, you know, what, what, what movies like to do. It's, you want to get your character at their lowest point between the character. Yeah. Yeah. Push them as far from each other as possible um, to make things as difficult as possible going into act three. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that kind of goes back to us hitting the, the tropes of the genre. I mean, there's a, there's a buddy element, a little bit of a buddy comedy element, buddy, you know, cop element. And um, they kind of start apart and then they grow together and then some stuff kind of pushes them o- away. But then, of course, they, they rally together to work together in the third act. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just kind of us playing around with that, with that, uh, with, with, with that storyline, with that, to, with, with that, the tropes of that storyline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you always had that real life event of David Duke coming to town to drive towards. You knew that was going to be like part of your third act. What can you tell me about this sort of construction of the element that is fictionalized? So this idea that this plot that set off this bomb and that the, the idea being that that would sort of spark this race war at this sort of very combustive time it, within this town's kind of like, yeah, there's, there's protesters on both sides and uh, the KKK realizes if we spark a bomb now, it will kick it all off. Yeah, I, I think we just as much as possible wanted to uh, make real the threat of a race war. Um, and we created this plot as kind of an extrapolation of a lot of the book uh, where the clans members would actually talk about uh, we want to go bomb this gay bar or, or this black church. And if you're Ron and you're listening to these uh, ideas uh, on the phone or, or, you know, as Chuck does in person, you, you're a cop, you have to take them seriously. And so I think part of what we were trying to do is, is get into the mind of Ron and think about what is the worst case scenario uh, for this particular plot. Um, and you know, it's the worst case scenario is, is really bad. (laughs) So, uh, you know, we, we wanted to use that to help us sort of anchor the story, um, and, and carry us the whole way and make it as cinematic as possible. Yeah. Also third acts, like they should be big, right? So it's like, and, and we should just make things as, as dire as possible the consequences, uh, uh, as Charlie said, uh, uh, as uh, the worst, the worst possible thing. So it's like, it's not just the bombing. Uh, it's also a, a race war. Like the, we're, we're just trying to push the stakes up a, as high as possible, trying to create this combustible situation in this town so that if, you know, if the, if the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the match is lit, it's, it's all going to, to, to blow up. Uh, and that's kind of also where we wanted to fit that steakhouse scene. So it's like, okay, if Ron is the bodyguard of David Duke, we have to put him in a situation where he's coming in contact with all these people that he's been fooling this entire movie. Uh, and that, you know, that steakhouse scene was pretty much from real life. And yeah. the, that, that picture was from real life. But in reality, it was, you know, it was Ron kind of messing around, so which is great, but uh, it doesn't work as well for a movie. So we wanted to place him in a context where there's actually real stakes, not just him kind of bamboozling the plan. And then after this sort of plot is foiled, after Ron kind of gets away and gets his picture, which is, I, I mean, I couldn't believe that was actually happened. When, I, when the film finished, I ran home and had to check that actually happened. Um, but then we kind of get this moment that, again, I don't think happened in real life, but you obviously felt was you obviously felt it was important to have this moment in the film where Ron's able to reveal to David Duke that, hey, I've been scamming you. Um, why was it important to kind of give the audience that satisfying feeling of, of seeing that kind of gotcha moment? I don't know. I just, it, I think it kind of just felt natural uh, to, to, to give them that, that feeling of satisfaction that catharsis um and just to kind of have some resolution with the david duke character because he doesn't get arrested nothing happens to him he's just he goes on free to you know talk about you know whatever he wants to talk about on his on his radio show and his his political pursuits um so it's it's almost like a form of of justice in a way uh the phone call uh revealing to david duke that you know, you've been bamboozled all of these it's, months. It's it, it, it's satisfying. It's almost like we want to give the, the audience <laughs> something. Yeah. Uh, and also that scene in particular for us, I think was a good lesson in 
adaptation because of course, you know, that didn't happen in, in real life, but in the book, Ron would talk about after that conversation where David Duke would say, Oh, I know I can tell the difference, you know, between how a black person and a white person talks. And it's by how they say are, you know, are, mm. uh, in the book, Ron would say, okay, to, so to mess with him in our future film conversations, I would, I would just say Ara, Ara instead of R, and David Duke would never notice. And when we read that, we we're like, oh, that's funny. Maybe we could kind of throw that in. But then we realized, well, let's not, in, in, when you're making a movie, like you have to make it, you have to like make it sharper. Yeah. So it's like, okay, instead of doing that kind of willy nilly, let's just, let's put that in that scene as a way to signal to David Duke that he's been had. And it gives the extra benefit of he says it when when he says it, it's before he reveals it. And so the audience catches on at about the same time that David Duke, or maybe a little bit before David Duke. And it's so it's allowing the audience to make that connection. It's almost like the movie and the audience have like a, an inside joke that they share that we can all laugh about. Uh, and so they get that before the final uh, slam dunk that, that Ron gives to, to, to do. An all important question. What did Ron make of the movie? Were you, the first time he was watching it, did you kind of have your hearts in your mouths a little bit like, oh God, I hope he likes this? I think he's seen it like, what, 30, 40, some, some odd times? <laughs> he's seen it so <laughs> many times because he does all these um, Q&As and he, he'll just go and watch the movie. I think it's a dream come true for, for Ron and, and then some, you know, not only to get a movie made about yourself, but to have, you know, someone as legendary as Spike Lee directing it. And of course, having it go on, having Ron go, go to the Academy Awards and, and, and be on stage and, and have the film receive so many accolades. It's, it's more than I could have ever hoped for. Mm. You, you definitely see it go wrong sometimes where someone, it, it actually, it happens all the time. Somebody writes a book, uh, and it gets adapted and the authors don't like it or uh, something is made of their true story and the authors don't like it. Um, it w we're, we're thrilled that that didn't happen with Ron. It's the opposite. Ron is very happy with the film. And uh, when the movie came out, his book was re-released. Uh, it was like, uh, it, it got a re-release with the publisher and it became a New York Times bestseller. Um, and Ron spent basically that whole year we you know we were talking to him and his and his wife they're like we're, we live on an airplane because he was just giving talks everywhere um so yeah it's we're, we're one of the things that we're super happy about is that uh ron is is happy with the film and and, and things have gone well for him since and how about the first time for you guys? I mean, you mentioned you had, you had seen the shooting script and also, come on, it, it's Spike. You know it's going to be good. You, you presumably, you're not as nervous as you might otherwise be if your baby was in the hands of other filmmakers. But what was it like, the rush of emotions that first time you see this film that you guys had written? Yeah, the culmination of all your hard work. I couldn't feel much because I was drinking too much beforehand. <laughs> um, I mean, keep in mind, this is the first time at Cannes that we were going to see the film uh, <laughs> in its entirety. This is the very first time we were going to meet Spike Lee and many of the cast members, John David Washington, Adam Driver, Laura Harrier. And so there was just almost too much to take in in a short amount of time. Um, but I mean, looking back and, and just seeing how incredible it was that it all came together like that, I think now Dave and I are in a phase where we're like, okay, now we're working at a pace on a bunch of other movies and TV projects where they're going at a pace that they're supposed to be going at because what we did with Black Klansman, it's, uh, you know, not normal for, for a project to, to snowball forward so quickly. Um, and, and, and now we're actually dealing with, you know, real Hollywood realities uh, for some projects. Some projects are moving faster, some are moving a little bit slower. If you were drinking before you saw the film and then you saw the film and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to think about how much you drank afterwards. It was, it was a lot. I, I, <laughs> the, I mean, because it was, it was our first time in Cannes also. And, you know, you go to that huge theater they have there and there's the red carpet and everything and all these photographers on one side or another and you walk up the steps and um 
Charlie very smartly said, hey, let's get behind the cast because the photographers are not going to take photos of us because who are we? <laughs> but they'll take photos of Adam Driver and Spike Lee. So you can see like our faces like behind <laughs> Adam Driver and Spike <laughs> Lee in the photos looking like, like we're completely out of place. Um, but then, you know, when you sit down in this massive theater and we sat down and maybe a minute, we were the last ones to enter the theater, the us and, and Spike and, and the cast and the producers. And then the movie basically like started a minute later. Couldn't even really like settle in because it's just going. And it was just a very surreal situation. And it, 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 you know, it played well. We were walking back down. We got into these cars that took us to the after party. And in the car, we realized that while the movie was playing, the trailer had dropped uh, all around the world suddenly. So it was like almost like the word was out uh, while we were watching the movie. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of like a, an, an overwhelming uh, experience. I can imagine. Yeah. As you mentioned, it was so well received and the accolades and the acclaim kind of really snowballed from there. But there was a little bit of critique, too, as well. There was... Um, Boots Riley, who directed Sorry to Bother You, he kind of mentioned about how much he obviously recognized the film as like a masterful work, but he also felt that maybe it wasn't so appropriate to tell an anti-racist story from the viewpoint of good cops. And it's interesting because now we're a couple of years along, post-George Floyd, I think we're having kind of another moment in pop culture at the minute where we're asking, how useful is it to tell stories celebrating good cops in a time where anti-racist activists are trying to highlight the fact that actually a lot of cops are just straight up bad? Is that a conversation that you guys have been paying much attention to as people who negotiated that difficult balancing act with Black Klansmen? Where do you stand on the argument today? What I do when it relates to the film, because it has come up, um, I kind of take my cues from Ron, who's very outspoken on Facebook um, about his views on, on cops uh, and the fact that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with. He's, and it's very clear from what he says that he has lost a lot of friends in law enforcement because of how outspoken he is about the, really? the situation. Yeah. Uh, but he's unapologetic. And of course, he's unapologetically anti-Trump. Uh, and, um, yeah, so it, 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 it's the type of thing where it's just like it in us doing the movie, I kind of look to Ron to, to see how he, re, you know, he's reacting to it. Cause I, I think he gives the best barometer to it. Um, and when, when the Boots Riley stuff came out, I thought, you know, I thought we, or we thought it was, it was, it was an interesting, uh, it, it was interesting comments and it was like, we, feel like we welcome any conversation about the film but ultimately like i think we decided it's not our place to to answer about his comments specifically there's two people who who probably should be answering and that's ron and spike yeah. uh, and they did separately and um i i don't know i, I like sorry to bother you that was a good yeah one. <laughs> which, which funnily enough actually has quite of a lot of the same sort of like Little themes and there's echoes of 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 your film in 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 Boots film, like the idea of like code switching and sort of like, well, sort of phone call deception, <laughs> putting on like a a voice to kind of I don't know. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but guys, yeah, you mentioned there that um, you mentioned a moment ago that you are now kind of working on new projects and you've had like a kind of different experience of Hollywood life since then, kind of working at a slightly slower pace. Can you tell me a bit about what those projects are and, and what we're going to see from you guys next? We've got so many things going um, that are in early phases of development that are hopefully going to be in production. Uh, certain things that we just started working on right now. Um, one of the things that we're working on now is a TV pilot for a limited series. Um, which is another book adaptation. That's the project we're, you know, super excited about because this is going to be kind of our first foray into television. And uh, yeah, it's something we're, we're really excited about and see where it goes. We wrote a, an adaptation of a book called Animal, which is by this New York Times uh, bestselling author, Casey Sherman. He's done a bunch of stuff. It's kind of 
based on uh, true events, but we 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 embellish and kind of make it into a, it's kind of a witness protection origin story that we make into an action thriller. Has that gone into production yet? No, not yet. <laughs> we're we're sort of playing the waiting game right now. Um, I suppose everyone it, is. It's totally yeah. out of our control, and of of course, the pandemic doesn't help that along. Yeah. Well, guys, I can't wait to see all of these projects. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I love this film. It's been an absolute blast revisiting it with you. Thank you so much for coming on Script Apart and sharing with us your first draft of Black Klansman. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kemal Demek, with music from Stefan Bindley-Taylor. Get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us the script apart podcast at gmail.com thanks for listening we'll see you next time